and Holy Spirit. secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. reading from the first book of Kings. Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of a cherubim. And when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, 
and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hands. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner, who is not of your people Israel, comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breast part, the, the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith and which you will be able to quench the all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, my message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. 
For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. William Stringfellow was an Episcopalian who was a lawyer and a theologian. He was both of these things as an openly gay man in the 1960s and 70s, and in the words of Archbishop Rowan Williams, he was the greatest American theologian in the 20th century. Stringfellow wrote extensively on the things covered in today's reading in Ephesians, and rather than to try to summarize his writings, I'd like to read you a portion of something he wrote. According to the Bible, the principalities are legion in species, number, variety, and name. They are designated by such multifarious titles as powers, virtues, thrones, authorities, dominions, demons, princes, strongholds, lords, angels, gods, elements, spirits. Terms that characterize are frequently used biblically in naming the principalities, tempter, mocker, foul spirit, destroyer, adversary, the enemy, and the privity of the principalities to the power of death incarnate is shown and mentioned to their agency to Beelzebul, or Satan, or the devil, or the Antichrist. And if some of these seem quaint, transposed into contemporary language, they lose quaintness, and the principalities become recognizable and all too familiar. They include all institutions, all ideologies, all images, all movements, all causes, all corporations, all bureaucracies, all traditions, all methods and routines and conglomerates, all races, all nations, all idols. Thus, writes Stringfellow, the Pentagon, or the Ford Motor Company, or Harvard University, or the Hudson Institute, or the Diners Club, or the Olympics, or the Teamsters Union, are principalities. So are capitalism, Maoism, humanism, Mormonism, astrology, the Puritan work ethic, science and scientism, white supremacy, patriotism, plus many, many more. Sports, sex, any profession or discipline, technology, money, the family. Beyond all prospect of full enumeration, the principalities and powers are legion." End quote. We can all too easily ignore the scriptures when they warn us of the cosmic powers of this present darkness because we believe ourselves to be enlightened, beyond the need for such language. We believe to our own peril that the cartoonish exaggerations of head-spinning, pea-soup-hurling demons in movies are the threat which the Bible warns us against. But a string fellow, Walter Wink, Rowan Williams and others have tried to tell us the real danger of the powers and the principalities lurk everywhere in the words of 1 Peter, like a hungry lion looking for someone to devour. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, heavenly places are not to be thought of as ghosts prowling about in the clouds. They are the cultures and spirits that categorize organizations and institutions. We talk about businesses as having a culture, or football teams having team spirit and other such things. 
The biblical authors recognized these things in their own day, but they named them differently, directly. We have named them innocuously, believing falsely that a rose by any other name will no longer bear thorns. But all of these things are, at their core, about the same thing, survival. If your job has to choose between keeping you on, keeping you on, or shutting its doors, it's going to give you the ax every time. If your bank has to choose between giving you a loan or protecting its bottom line, it's going to choose the bottom line every time. We call this good business sense, but it is merely the fall manifesting itself over and over again. Behind this manifestation of the fall, the ruler of this world is revealed. Behind every impersonal decision that prioritizes the nameless, faceless entities of idolatry lies death. And the angel of death, the spirituality of death, the culture of death, the spirit of death, which our forebearers called Satan. Writes Stringfellow, Death, after all, is no abstract idea, nor merely a destination in time, nor an occasional happening, nor only a reality for human beings, but both biblically and empirically, death names a moral power, claiming sovereignty over all people and all things in history. Apart from God, death is a living power greater because death survives them all, than any other moral power in this world, and of whatever sort, human beings, nations, corporations, culture, wealth, knowledge, fame, or memory, language, the arts, race, religion. This means, theologically speaking, that the objects of allegiance and servitude, the real idol secreted within all idolatries, the power above all principalities and powers, the idol of all idols, is death. How else might one describe this culture of death that has gripped the world in the throes of this pandemic? We have seen over and over again the outright intransigence of those who refuse to take their medicine. Normally rational, law-abiding, do-gooding neighbors and friends can very quickly be absorbed into a spirit of irrationality. Facts and figures will not dissuade them. Pleas of moral responsibility or civic duty or religious obligation will not work. Whereas normally we could reason with someone, there are certain things which defy logic. What other language do we have to describe a man who is an otherwise upstanding member of the community, stable in his life, job, and relationships, who one day kills his young children under the delusion that they were infected with an evil seed, or other likewise stable people who load up and drive 12 hours to shoot up a pizzeria because they believe there was a child sex ring being run out of the basement, despite lacking any evidence. What other language do we have to grasp the unimaginable horror and evil destruction of life that we have witnessed? I'm not suggesting that the perpetrators of these acts and others like them are not responsible or that the devil made them do it as a defense, but I ask you sincerely whether a mental break or a political agenda or a military strategy or business sense does sufficient justice in naming the atrocities we have witnessed in history. But once we come to name the cosmic powers of this present darkness and identify them, we can then do something about it. Stringfellow reminds us that if we want to do something, we must first weep. We must first care enough to weep. But today's reading makes clear that we are not absolved from acting against these powers. We are called to do battle against them, as St. Paul uses a variety of Roman war-making metaphors to tell us how. Put on the whole armor of God, he says, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything, stand firm. 
Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We are called to be a people categorized by our freedom in God to withstand evil. Christians must be a people who can look deep within the powers and principalities and see death at their root and declare with boldness the victory of the risen Christ. And having done everything, having done all that we can do to solve the wounds of those trapped beneath the wheel of injustice, we are to drive a spoke in the wheel itself. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, having done what we can to heal those trapped in the domination system of the powers and the principalities, we are now to challenge the domination system itself, death itself, with none other than the risen life of Christ our God. He tells us to stand, to get in the fighting stance, to prepare your body for prayer. Don't lie about on the sofa and lazily cast your prayers to God, but pay attention and concentrate. The Lord has fashioned your body. Use it. Fasten the belt of truth, because by the truth will the powers be unmasked. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, because by righteousness will we show the world God's will. Put on the helmet of salvation so that you may be confident of the victory already won in Christ. Take up the shield of faith and guard your heart from the flaming arrows of temptation, particularly the temptation to forget that we are not battling others. We are seeking to free them, as Paul says, from the final enemy to be defeated, death. And take up your sword, the word of God, so that in the face of an evil larger than yourself, you may, as 1 Peter says, always be prepared to give an account for the hope that is within you. The battle we are called to is one of immense prayer. Because as Walter Wink writes, prayer is the only way we can consolidate by continual affirmation the divine counter-reality which alone is real and freight it into being. Wink continues that the writer of Ephesians has no notion here of Christian life as a last-ditch, rear-guard, defensive operation. This is a war with the powers of evil. He depicts the church taking the fight to the enemy, and he expects the church to win. When Jesus established his church, he said that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and he meant it. But the church has to be the church. We cannot confuse ourselves into thinking that we're merely one loose association of like-minded people. Do not be ignorant of your calling. We are the heirs of a great tradition, the children of a fierce and mighty God. We have faced down evil and empire and persecution and destruction and death, and through our Savior, we are more than conquerors. We are the universal, mystical body of Christ for whom he gave his life and descended into death itself to make captivity captive and rising from the grave destroyed its seal and hold on us. As Stringfellow puts it, the church is the embassy of the eschaton, the end of time. The church is the trustee of the society which the world, not subjected to the power of death, is to be on that last day when the world is fulfilled in all things in God. Not because we know what we're doing, not because we have all the answers or because we're never wrong, but because when we are wrong, when we do fall short and sin, we face our failings without panic. Unlike the powers and the principalities, the institutions and personalities totally dedicated to never being wrong, the church stands as a body that knows how to address sin and not collapse. The powers attack that which threatens them, but do not fear the powers. As Ephesians says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. The world, the ruler of this world, will revolt, but take heart, he says, for I have overcome the world. But we still die, you might say, 
Yes, this is something the martyrs understood all too well. And yet they persisted because they knew and know that through Christ, even death is made subservient to the God of life. As Martin Luther said in his magnificent hymn, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. We must remember this so that we can stand and remind the powers. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Every person caught in the iron bars of the domination system, the oppressed and the oppressor, the victim and the murderer, the tenants and the landlords, all people whom death has taken and will ultimately take will be drawn to him at the last who for all people took up his cross, that he might steal us from the power of death. For though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for those preparing for baptism, especially Brad, 
and confirmation, especially Josh, Kirk, Lyman, Kim, and Kay, and to be received into this communion, especially Pete, Teresa, and Melissa. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for the people of Haiti and Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use and conserve its gifts rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all the blessings of our lives. Beauty and laughter. Especially for the birthdays of Jerry Harper, Teresa Hoffmeister, and Sister Anna Grace, and the 42nd anniversary of Lynn and Monty Walford. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for an end to the pandemic and that you comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Wanda, Ellen, Mary, Margaret, Martha, Gabriella, Corrine, Robert, Julie, Sarah Lou, Drew Dodson's family, Jean, Ann, Buzzy, Robin, Maggie, John, Richard and Sandra, Charles, Josh, Barbara, Elizabeth, Robson, Linda, Justin, Maureen, Della, Mim, Blaine, Teresa, Patsy, Juanita, Linda and her family, Brady, Angela, Catherine and Paul, Robert, Cynthia, Lewis, David, Connie, Curtis, Mary, Cheryl, Bill, Chris, Mary Ann, James. Are there others? Others. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Joe Nickel, David, Richard Van Aken, Burton King, Robert Horney. Are there others? Lee, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, 
and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements on receiving Holy Eucharist. First, just to say that uh, in the Episcopal Church, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive the Holy Eucharist. Here in just a moment, you'll come forward and come up to the altar rail and receive Holy Communion. Uh, if you would like to receive just the bread, kneel at the altar rail if you're able and hold out your hand. Uh, if you would like to have the bread dipped into the wine for you, uh, if you would, please just stand at the altar rail so that I know to dip the bread for you. When you come forward, the ushers will have hand sanitizer for you to dab on your hands uh, and do that. And this is all in an effort to mitigate the spread of COVID. And, uh, you know, things may not go as smoothly as we like them to, but we'll get through it and we'll get through it together. Um, I think that's all I've got. Is there anything I'm forgetting? Walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through your prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with blessed William Stringfellow, the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. 
By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to